I focus on more of these subtle experiences of gendered racism that play themselves out in our everyday lives as women of color. So um, gender racial microaggressions are subtle and everyday verbal, behavioral, and environmental expressions of oppression based on the intersection of one's race and gender. And so I've done a lot of research with, um, for, with young women, with women of across the age spectrum. This, I wanna share a little bit of my qualitative work um, that was focused on black women's experiences. But again, I'll highlight the ways in which many of these characteristics are pre prevalent for women of color. Um, and again, are also rooted with, so there's some commonalities with women of color's experiences, but also uniqueness that I hope that we can talk about as well. Um, so I, what I found in some of my qualitative work interviewing and having conversations with Black women college students is that women reported these three core themes, projected stereotypes, and these are being reduced to stereotypes. So the expectation of the Jezebel or the hypersexualized image um, of a woman of color, the expectation of the angry Black woman, or I know there's also kind of the fiery Latina stereotype, right, and how those play themselves out. There's also ways that women are silenced and marginalized, and this is being made ignored in professional workplace or other school settings and having one's contributions minimized. That includes struggle for respect and invisibility. And then assumptions about style and beauty, which includes assumptions about communication styles and assumptions about aesthetics. So really briefly, just wanna also highlight some of the work I've done on coping with gendered racial microaggressions, um, where again, there is this process of deciding how to handle these situations. Um, there's often this primary appraisal process. So at first you experience a microaggression, you have to assess, okay, whether or not this situation is stressful. Often you might feel like you're still trying to figure out what the heck just happened to you, right? Um, and then, so then you engage in that secondary appraisal process um, and you try to evaluate and pick and choose your battles and figuring out what coping options um, you could use. Um, and then, you know, folks, again, in some of the research that I've done have talked about these various coping strategies. So using resistance strategies, speaking out and using your voice as power, um, quickly, you know, and being more active in saying something about the microaggression, educating the perpetrator, some of those things. But again, those, the, those things take a lot of um, um, an emotional toll. They take a lot of energy. Um, so some folks might choose to engage in other ways, such as collective coping, leaning on our support networks. Folks might also use what I call self-protective coping. So again, in the coping literature, they might call this more passive coping or avoidant coping. I call it self-protective because women make very intentional decisions and they're very strategic about when they are going to choose to deal with those things and when they're go um, going to choose to walk away, like the example that was just shared. You know, sometimes it takes a lot more energy to speak out and speak up in that moment. And you might choose to kind of protect your peace, as some people say, and just choose to walk away, disengage. Or one thing I really heard folks talk about is, you know, I, they just choose not to put themselves in situations where they expect there's going to be some gender racial microaggressions, right? So you might find within your work environment or school environment, you choose to hang out with other women of color, right? And you're like, I'm not going to go to that frat party, um, or I'm not going to do these certain things that you know might put yourself at greater risk of experiencing these microaggressions. So I think those are other things that are important.